So then um, I would like to welcome uh, everybody today to this uh, webinar. I'm very happy and uh, I'm very looking forward and, and I'm also proud that uh, Anthony Mayen, so Professor Anthony Mayen will today talk about uh, a specific area of REACT. Uh, REACT is uh, a new technical committee of IEEE GRSS and is dealing with uh, everything that has to do with climate and climate change and the observation, uh, how we can uh, uh, observe, let me say, uh, uh, change effects or climate change um, contributing to the change of, of our environment. Uh, we I also like to combine this with the sustainable development goals in order to see how we can support the sustainable development goals using remote sensing tools. So that's a little bit about React and React should be a framework where people are connecting or in working together, uh, also establishing pro, um, kind of rules um, and also let me say frameworks how to uh, how um, how we should let me say support uh, the environment um, in terms of using remote sensing um, instruments like for example processing techniques also also development uh, of uh, uh, products for example for climate change so are all these things are combined somehow in a networking uh, framework within react and one of these um, smaller groups that we have established and this is one of the first series today is in principle to talk about uh, the needs uh, and the requirements of the pacific islands so and uh, therefore i'm happy that today uh, tony Marin will talk about it uh, what are the needs and uh, how we can support actually um, the Pacific Island regions uh, with remote sensing tools. Yeah, that's, uh, let me say, a short introduction uh, on this uh, framework and, and the series that we will have. So from, for the next, we will have also related uh, other topics which are related to agriculture and also to flood estimation in specific regions. Yeah, so then uh, I would just hand over to Tony and I'm looking forward uh, to see you uh, what we can or how we can help the Pacific Islands uh, to be established, um, let me say, as a working group uh, within REACT. Thank you, Irina and um, colleagues. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talk about the uh, Pacific region. Um, I won't go into any more introductions because I know our time is, is limited, um, but REACT actually supported uh, the Pacific Islands or chose the Pacific Islands as one of three focal, area, focal areas that they're considering. And so um, what I want to do is, um, well, it was, <laughs> I can't, I can't move my pointer. I, I can't move onto the screen. Um, can you move the slide? I, when I change the pointer, I, it's not working. Oh, maybe that's why. All right, look, I, in the time we've got, I want to introduce um, just the outline of the talk. I wanted to introduce the Pacific Island communities. I wanted to talk a little bit about GEO, the Group on Earth Observation and their work program, and the activities of what has become known as the Pacific Islands Advisory Group, or PIAGE, to look at some of the challenges in the Pacific and then to challenge REACT. A role for the REACT in the Pacific, question mark, yes. And finally, just to mention a, a Oceanus Geospatial Symposium that will be held in November and to which REACT is being invited to make a contribution. Um, all right, so first off, the Pacific Island communities. Um, the, the Southern Ocean is the, um, the Pacific, Southern Pacific Ocean is the world's largest ocean. Um, I can't see my, let me see if I can get rid of, there we go. The Pacific Ocean is 88 million square kilometers. Um, there are approximately 22 island nations and territories um, shown on the map there. And they come from three different um, ethno-cultural uh, backgrounds, Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia. Um, if you take the population of the islands themselves, there's over 5 million population, if you add Australia, Papua New Guinea and New Zealand to the consortium, then there's another 40 million people involved. 
Um, but our Pacific Island nations that we're talking about here, they're the most vulnerable region in the world. They are facing climate challenges that uh, we know nothing about because suddenly their, their um, houses are flooded, uh, sea levels rising, salt is uh, encrusting in, in, into all their agricultural areas and uh, groundwater is becoming contaminated. So there's great biodiversity loss um, and their livelihood actually depends on, on the oceans. And that's another topic that we could consider at some stage. But they're the Pacific Island communities. Now, if we look at them from a political point of view, uh, and, and if you've been catching up on any of the, um, uh, the news in the last few days, you know that they're a very sensitive geopolitical area at the moment. Um, I won't say any more about that, but if you look at the countries and the, and the territories there, there's something like 22 of them. Um, and they have formed what's been known as the Pacific Islands Forum. And this is their major intergovernment organization. Um, the flags that you see there are the countries that are currently members of it. Um, and this is the main deciding group for the, if you like, the political and the research um, strategies within the whole region. Um, the areas shown in blue are their economic zones. So they match up, as I said, uh, four times the area of Europe. In the uh, Pacific Islands Forum, they have a what's called a Council of Regional Organizations of the Pacific or CROP. And I just want to draw attention to this. This is the, the group that was established by the Pacific Islands Forum to mandate and to improve cooperation, coordination and collaboration on all things relating to sustainable development. Now, one of the uh, one, three of the organizations that exist within COP, one is called the Secretariat of the Pacific Community, SPC. And this is the agency for the region that holds responsibilities for disasters and natural hazard activities. Um, they're also the home of the development of the Digital Earth Pacific Data Cube, uh, which is happening as we speak. The second area, second uh, uh, group is the Pacific Region Environmental Program or SPREP. And this is the agency that is responsible for climate and climate change reporting and SDG reporting. The University of the South Pacific is a very unique organization in that it is jointly owned by 12 of the governments that you saw on the previous slide. Uh, and it has 14 campuses and 11 centers throughout the region. And um, it is it, it has the best uh, internet connection of anything in the uh, in the Pacific region. So these three organisations uh, are very important as we look at Earth, uh, Earth observation and uh, remote sensing. I'll come back to that in a moment. But a few words about Geo, the group of organ uh, group on Earth observation, and what is called the Geo Work Program. Now, GEO is an intergovernmental partnership of 113 countries. It also has a partnership with 140 participating organisations, of which, if you see there, I've circled in red, the GRSS is one of those participating organisations. And um, it's the fact that uh, I've been working with as the principal for GRSS on GEO for a couple of years. Um, if you go to the left-hand side, you can see that there's America Geo, Euro Geo, uh, Africa Geo, Asia Oceana Geo, and the CIS Caucus. Now, the four geos that you see there are inter uh, bodies that exist within Geo, but they're also run by the countries in those areas. And I'll say a little bit more about how Geo operates uh, in a moment. So, what does Geo do? Well, it primary uh, function is to advocate for the open sharing of Earth observation data and information to support uh, decision makings and actions related to sustainable development. Um, it engages a wide range of stakeholders, as you've seen from the previous slide, um, and tries to bring those stakeholders to understand the needs and collaborate on joint solutions to those needs. And then that's where it's relevant to the Pacific. Uh, to deliver uh, Earth observation-based methods and tools and services that will help build capacity and address the global and the regional challenges 
that exist within the area. So what does GEO focus on? There, there are four drivers to all the work that GEO is involved in at the present. Sustainable development, climate action, disaster risk reduction, and just um, three or four months ago, resilient cities and human settlements was added as a fourth driver. Um, what does the drivers mean? Well, I'll, again, I'll explain that in a moment in terms of when we look at the sort of activities and the sort of um, programs and projects that get going. Now, GEO started in about, if I remember correctly, 2004, 2005. And in 2005, it was probably, it was actually working under the name of the Global Earth Observation System of Systems or GEOS. Um, and that um, was in 2005, and that was the first 10 year plan. Um, you'll see along the top here that there are summits. Um, these, are, these are ministerial summits. Um, now they, they actually happen every four years when the ministers from various countries or the, their delegates turn up and decisions are made about the progress and the future of GEO. Uh, every year there is a GEO summit. Um, uh, sorry, there's a GEO um, week in November, uh, which the less mortals get together and, and work things out. But every now, you're, every four years, you're going to get these summits and that's where the decisions are made at a ministerial level. So you can see there that um, in 2005 was the first 10 year plan and 215 was the latest strategic plan which we're working under. And at 225, uh, 2025, sorry, um, the next geo, the next strategic plan will be um, implemented. So it, it, it functions as, as an agency for intergovernment and participating organization involvement. The, we have what's called a work program, and uh, you'll see more about the work program and how it operates. But what is a work program? Well, we attempt to, or GEO attempts to bring together GEO members, participating organizing, organizations, and others that can work together to focus on the user needs and products within, particularly within the developing and emerging world. Um, it is also very strongly connected to global policy organizations and frameworks. And that will become apparent in the next few slides. And it wants to use the program activities to develop reusable methods and results that can be applied and adapted by anyone. In other words, it's totally open and free. Um, if we look at um, putting that in a little bit more formal sense, um, and you can get all this information from the, from the GEO website if you want to follow it up, but um, any group, can come up with a pilot initiative and apply to GEO to become part of the work program. So a number of researchers in a, say in a city or in a town or, or even in a region can develop a project for research and development and put it into GEO and help and have the resources that GEO have to offer to support that particular development. And this is called a pilot initiative. Um, when that something comes out of that pilot initiative, it can be upgraded and transferred into what is called a GEO initiative. And the important thing here is that the GEO initiative becomes related to services at a national and regional impact, to have a national and regional impact rather than just simply a local. And then at times they become flagships. Um, they can become apply to become flagships. Now flagships address international um, mandates um, and I'll show you what the geo flagships are in just a moment. So these geo flagships are then transferred out into other organizations um, in this geospatial world um, and they exist by themselves. Now supporting that we have these regional geos which I mentioned earlier on Africa, Geo, um, Euro, uh, Asia, Pacific, etc. And each of these regional geos set up their own programs of research uh, using the countries that are involved in their particular um, consortium uh, to develop their own um, uh, approaches to addressing the challenges that they particularly have to focus on. And, and there's an enabling services sitting behind this called foundational tasks. Um, the, some of the examples that have happened that we have flagships, the 
one of the ones that people would have heard of is the Global Forest Observation Initiative. This initiative started off in GEO, but it's now housed within the, the FAO. Uh, Geo Clam uh, is related to food, food security, and it addresses a number of the international mandates that relate to that. Geo Bond with diversity and ecosystems. So these all function as individual and, and developing uh, mechanisms and organizations to address these particular activities. Um, okay, now, if you want to have a look at the work program for 2020, 2020 to 2022, then um, have a look at the website here, and you can just click on any of these particular uh, icons and understand what the, um, what the aims and objectives of the program are, who's involved, and what status it is, how far they've gone with their research. So um, down here we have the what was called community activities. These are now called pilot initiatives. So there's 36 uh, groups that had started off uh, three years ago looking at particular aspects. And so all you're going to need to do is just click on one of these and you'll, you'll get the information. There are 20 that have been upgraded. Um, and have the capacity to work as geo initiatives where they're addressing much um, broader and uh, universal uh, applications. And then you have the four flagships. And uh, supporting that underneath, you have the, the, the Zero Geo, Africa Geo, and America, et cetera. So, altogether, there's something like 64 programs and uh, research programs uh, and, and operational activities that exist within the geo work program. Now, this geo work program, as it exists, finishes in 2022 at the end of this year. Many of these activities will be carried on, but the application uh, is, is open for more participants. Um, okay, a word on the geo foundational tasks. This is the, um, if you like, the secretariat, the, uh, the functioning organization over here that manages things. This, this secretariat uh, is located in the World Health Organization in Geneva building. And they have a number of core activities in terms of supporting the work program, um, a number of working groups uh, set up. There's a GEOS platform that you can go to and download data from most parts of the world. Something like 40 million images are, or satellite images are available on that particular platform. And there's also other things there that you could, uh, you could look at. Um, satellite observations, moving towards in situ and including aerial observations within the, the data uh, that's been made available. And uh, there's the engagement priorities. Each of these sustainable development, climate action, disaster and resilient cities uh, have staff uh, at the office in Geneva that are able to support the um, activities of the various people in, and groups within the work program. So it's quite a, an interesting and, and well-developed structure. Um, okay, now, uh, just as I said, if you want more details on how it sits, it sits up, uh, set, set up, then um, please go to the website. But some of the things that have, have changed over the few years, the traditional approach for capacity development has generally been the user organization identifies a need, it provides and develops and delivers a course. Uh, recipients take the information and um, assessment is based on participant satisfaction. But I think more importantly, on how much of the information that's contained here is actually put into practice. And so the approach that uh, GEO is adopting uh, more recently is a what's called the co-creative approach, where the people that are uh, being trained and the people doing the training or advising on the research procedures, they get together. And so this complex problem is addressed by a joint effort and uh, a lot of technical capability, contextual knowledge and identified needs are uh, expressed. And this allows us to move in a form where assessment is based on, on, on real learning um, and certainly the future management of the problem is, is, uh, is anticipated and helped. Okay, so a couple of last things about the um, work program. The uh, new work program will come into being at the end of this year. So it will exist from 2020, 
2023 to 2025. And some of the changes that in that work program now, we're looking for, GEO is looking for a greater collaboration and integration across the, the various activities. In other words, if people are working on climate change and there's something like 20 odd um, project programs or initiatives within the program that I showed you before, working on climate change to bring them closer together so that redundancy disappears. Uh, and there's, there's a, a move going forward of sharing so there's a stronger emphasis also on open knowledge um, and making this commonly available to anybody that wants the information um, and relating it to intended and actual users. In other words, it's just not research out there. It, ha it has an application and uh, it's designed to meet the needs uh, of actual users. Um, and it is a, just a clearer definition of categories and we won't need to talk about that. Okay, so if anybody is interested in knowing more about how you would apply to become part of the DO work program, then uh, have a look at this particular um, URL. And already the call for the next review, the next um, program ha has been made um, and moving forward to actually the, the approval process. All the details of how you'd go about that are, is, are provided on, on the website. Okay, so enough for GEO and the GEO work program. Um, I mentioned the ministerials. Every four years now, there's a ministerial. The last one was held in Canberra, uh, Australia in November, 2019. Um, and the result of that was that the, the ministerial summit uh, moved article 10 and 11, which uh, you can read, but it really what it's saying uh, to welcome new members of the Pacific and other islands into the, into the GEO community and emphasize the importance of these countries and how GEO might best serve their needs. Um, GEO doesn't go in and um, undertake a project uh, and move out. GEO is, is more to advise how we can bring clients within the countries uh, and the, uh, if you like their picks in the specific region together with those that can help and assist. Um, so there was a Canberra declaration, but the Pacific Islands made their own Telenoa statement. Now, really what a Telenoa statement means, it's a word that is used quite commonly in the Pacific. And it simply means, Telenoa means a place for oceanic voices by oceanic voices. So it's saying, okay, we'll tell you what we need in terms of Earth observation in the Pacific. And what they asked for was this assistance uh, of trying to bring together what the work program was doing with what their needs were. Um, you can, uh, again, this is, this is available, this is a 10 hour statement, but the two things came, came together and a, the, um, the ministerial decided to set up a Pacific Islands Advisory Group or PIAG. Uh, now, the, the primary purpose of this group was to understand the Earth observation needs and the priorities of the Pacific and to advise on how to strengthen and how to support geolinks with the PICs, Pacific Island countries and territories. Um, this was established in May 19, uh, uh, sorry, 2020. Um, membership, it had five governments, Australia, France, New Caledonia, USA, China, and the European community. There were um, a number of participating organizations, including Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society that are on this group. It has three chairs, the Pacific community from SPC, um, from China, and from Australia. Uh, and that has been operating um, since May 2020. Now you say, well, what does the PIC do? Um, again, you can look at this at, <laughs> at your leisure. I'm not going to go through it, but we've identified five things, scope, consult, connect, align, and advise. Uh, the advise goes back to the ex community, the communi this is the XCOM of, the, of GEO. Um, so at the moment, and I'll show you, uh, say a little bit more about this on the next slide. 
but uh, we're preparing resources and references that relate to a capability statement and, and a guide of how the uh, island countries might use um, GEO. Uh, we've consulted with a number of groups, uh, including the university and uh, UNESCAP, uh, an outside organization that wishes to be involved and working together with a lot of PIC members and individuals. We're trying to engage the Pacific uh, and other groups together uh, and provide some training uh, or opportunities for them to train. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about the SCAP involvement in just a moment. So this is primarily the, what PAG is trying to do um, is bring these things together. So if you look at um, the supporting documents, the first thing there that the, a capability statement is being prepared, which will outline the value proposition of the geo to the Pacific Island regions. In other words, tell them what, what it is, what how we can help them. Once we know the needs, uh, we'll identify parts of the geo work program, which may be of interest to them and try and involve them within those groups that already exist. And also to come up with a directory of Pacific Island what we call the island region ecosystem, which will outline the Pacific ecosystem and the main challenges that they face. So it's, a, it's an ongoing consultancy um, to try and work and find champions and develop a community uh, within the Pacific. Uh, not easy with the 22 countries and the geographic displacement that, that they find themselves in. Interestingly, um, we're reaching out and have been re have been in contact with SCAP in Asia, and uh, they've asked to join with um, Geo and uh, in PRs, uh, in order to in, in improve um, support countries for this disaster risk management, climate change adaption, and sustainable development. So they they have a a mandate for the Pacific as well as for Asia. And uh, we're linking those into the, the program in support. UNDRR, the Office of Disaster Risk Reduction, are uh, also involved. Um, and the SCAP sub-regional office for the Pacific, which is located in Fiji, is also involved in this uh, collaboration and support. Um, so there's a lot of activity there. The last um, year, at the end of last, well, September last year, um, Geoscience and the Remote Sensing Society, our society, have a MOOC, um, which is um, Remote Sensing Image Analysis, uh, sorry, Acquisition Analysis and Applications. And uh, this was made available free to anybody in the Pacific Islands that wanted to um, do it, join in it. It was a three month program and uh, we sponsored over 80 applicants or participants in this, uh, in, in this region to introduce them to remote sensing image analysis and acquisition. Um, this was done through USP, the University of South, the Southern, uh, South Pacific. Um, and as I said to you, this is a university which is owned by 12 Pacific Island countries. Um, and each of those countries have campuses on their member uh, in, in, in their, in their locate, locations. Uh, we hope to do more on this in the, in the future. So there is an opportunity for individual organizations to support what is already going on. All right, let's come to now to look at um, what are some of the logistical issues if you are interested in working in the Pacific on supporting uh, development of earth observation and remote sensing. Um, these are some of the logistical issues that have arisen, right? The resources, they're very small governments. Um, they have big remits and they have a challenge to find trained staff. Um, there's a need to identify the needs and priorities of the island countries. Um, and uh, in that reduced reduplication of things uh, that are taking place. Or, uh, the achieving the balance is important. Um, trying to find what support structures will quickly uh, fit the purpose for these countries and territories uh, is difficult. And if you look at the time zones, then 8 a.m. in Geneva is 6 p.m. in Suva and 7 p.m. in Apia and 8 p.m. in Honolulu and 1 a.m. in Chicago. Um, 
So there is a broad spread, uh, not only around the world, but within the Asian uh, Pacific area itself. So there's some of the logistical issues. Um, some of the Earth observation or remote sensing issues, um, we're working on trying to get satellite sensors turned on over the region. Um, some of the satellite providers or sent, uh, uh, just turn their systems off over the Pacific because of the, uh, that it's all ocean and very little land. So uh, particularly with radar, we're trying to get more um, coverage over the region. Um, we find that Earth observation is underutilized for spatial analysis and decision making. And the idea of continuous monitoring of resources is, is difficult to uh, for people in, in the organizations, local organizations to take up. Um, the higher cloud cover and the, the small targets uh, of interest, that if you're dealing with atolls uh, or mangroves along the coastlines or very narrow islands, then it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a lot of data capture. Uh, so uh, drones and aerial imagery will be important. Um, more significantly, there's a lack of extensive computer power and technical skill knowledge that's required to process data sets at scale. Um, the platform that's being developed, the Data Cube, the Digital Earth Pacific Data Cube, may uh, help to solve some of these problems. But at the moment, um, that is a, a distinct disadvantage uh, for the region. Uh, expensive internet, low bandwidth for processing analysis, and a lack of awareness on sometimes on the incentive to invest in long-term monitoring strategies. Um, so these are some of the uh, the issues that need to be addressed uh, in terms of trying to support the region. Um, there have been a number of reports done, and I've just listed two. Uh, they're recent ones. Um, this was a CSIRO report uh, from an international conference that was held in, uh, I think it was 2019, uh, 20,000. 2019. I'll get it right sooner or later. And then the Digital Earth Pacific um, organization actually did a survey last year from a number of countries and, and islands, uh, found out what their needs were. And you can get those uh, from the website uh, that are listed. So let me just draw you uh, now to the, um, the activities that I think are a challenge to GEO. They're a challenge certainly to GRSS um, and challenge to React. Um, I've taken this out of the, the uh, data cube uh, survey uh, because it's the most recent one, but these are what came up as tier one priority areas uh, in terms of earth observation needs. So agriculture, climate change, particularly coastline change detection, forest cover change, Mapping uh, cyclones, inundation modeling and flooding is a major problem. Uh, developing digital elevation models uh, for these uh, many islands that are there and urban development as, as flooding um, and salinity problems with local water uh, come. Um, so that was just, that's one example of where the needs have been defined. Uh, the CSIRO, report that was done um, in 2019 lists a number of um, SDS sustainable development goals and number 15. And I'm not going to go through these, I'm just putting it there, but they found um, from consultation in the region that the availability of fine spatial and spectral resolution data, which is matched to the needs of small island, island monitoring uh, is, a, is a major need. And also the ability, the availability and access to data and to identify and fill the gaps as, as they appear. And so there are other issues that are raised there. So there's a challenge for somebody to take on um, if they were wanting to work in, in, the, in the Pacific region. Another one I just <coughs> identified too, and this is fresh water, uh, because 50% of residents lack access to safe drinking water um, with quantity and quality. Um, and the risk to supply is amplified by inundation from rising sea levels and, and the rising groundwater. So I highlight these because they are critical um, and they are a challenge 
the finishing up, um, the Pacific Island Forum has adopted what they call a 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific Continent. They're calling this area the Blue Pacific Continent. And this strategy is an opportunity for them to identify all the challenges and build on their strengths and collectively determine the future of the Blue Pacific continent. But they can't do it without support and help. Um, uh, Henry Puna, who was the Secretary General of the, um, of the Pacific Islands Forum, made this statement last uh, November when he said, uh, we are the Blue Pacific continent. And we are the front lines of the climate change crisis. Our islands, our ocean, our people already face the devastating impacts of climate change, including rising sea levels, king tides and ravaging cyclones. Limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees, this is our survival roadmap. Um, so having said all that, is there a possible role for REACT? Now, these comments, <laughs> These comments are straight out of my mind. Um, the main question that arises to me is, is how could members of REACT become engaged in working with people in the Pacific to get the information needs that are needed now to address SDG goals and the impacts of climate change as it's affecting them? And thinking about that, then maybe, maybe, uh, together, I'm not only saying REACT, but maybe through the GRSS and GEO, uh, we could design and implement some remote sensing initiatives that would help provide application analytics and image processing routines. Uh, my observation would be the application analytics and the image processing routines are the things that simply do not exist uh, within the local areas and agencies that are responsible for making decisions related to sustainable goals. They exist in two or three organizations, but um, that skill is not there and certainly the equipment is not there. Um, I wonder whether we could do something to assist with training so the Pacific Islands and territories can realize the benefits of Earth observation. Um, what about helping in addressing the problems of SDGs and climate change and disaster events so that uh, they can achieve a sustainable management of their homelands and future. This should be, the, I guess, the, the broad goal of that within the context of the sustainable goals and the climate change. Uh, now, I've been in GRSS for many years and, uh, and working closely on, uh, with um, Paul Rosen on the uh, global activities portfolio, in the global activities portfolio. Um, and uh, it's there to help also with the REACT. But um, when I think about it, I, I come up with this, a think tank or a meeting to exchange ideas or a conference paper are not sufficient options. What is needed is a new model that would allow GRSS to support addressing the immediate information needs of vulnerable communities. And some of these information needs are mapping mangrove retreat, along narrow coast and uh, narrow island reef zones, um, inundation mapping and flood prediction, land cover mapping at local scales. And these just name a few of the fundamental applications that are needed immediately for good decision making. So I, I guess I'm throwing the challenge out and I hope we can have some discussion as to how we could, how, how REACT might possibly react, <laughs> sorry. Um, to the challenge that's out there in the Pacific Islands because it is becoming extreme and certainly the geopolitical atmosphere in the region at the moment uh, is, is charging up. Uh, okay, lastly, um, to make you all aware that um, a, a, a fundamental, I'll say it's a fundamental um, sharing conference from all those islands and also the uh, outside supporters, the Oceanic Geospatial Symposium is going to be held in New, in New Mia, uh, the capital of New Caledonia, in November. And this is a symposium that will bring together uh, all the islands and all those working in the remote sensing and geospatial world to address uh, sustainable development. Um, 
okay? And so it's being built as a regional community event where people could come together and try to solve, or try to identify and solve some of these problems related to regional needs from regional means uh, finding the solutions. Now, this is a GRSS supported event uh, in the sense that we are making a contribution to the running of the conference, the fund. And um, I've already been told that REACT participation uh, is welcome to the participation would be taking part in, in, in either uh, the, the training programs or looking at regional needs or looking at regional needs. Uh, and so the invitation, it's an open invitation to seriously consider uh, being part of this um, ocean geospatial conference. Okay, and with that, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Tony, for this very comprehensive uh, and uh, I would say, um, yeah, very well summarized uh, presentation about the needs and uh, what is uh, what is GEO and how GEO is, has a role in this Pacific Island, but also what, what are the needs of the Pacific Islands and how, let me say, REACT could play also a role to, to combine or to get people together to work on specific uh, topics. Yeah, I think this uh, probably provides a good basis for discussion or even uh, opinion exchange, uh, I would say. So both uh, is available. And also thanks for, for pointing out uh, about this conference um, that uh, is uh, yeah, taking place in November. And probably it's a good opportunity also that people, let me say, from the geoscience community are contributing to it and showing what they can do, right? Uh, nowadays and so that they can also contribute to the knowledge sharing uh, with this people with the local people there um, yeah thanks a lot first um, I would just open now the discussion or even if there's somebody who likes to ask a question uh, then you're welcome to do so uh, we would like to ask you that raise the hand I see already one hand is raised and then I can pick up uh, the people and you can speak up so we start with the first one, which is John Kellis. Uh, good day. I guess it's evening over there. Thanks for <laughs> the presentation. Midnight, midnight, midnight. Midnight. <laughs> midnight. Uh, thanks for staying up. <laughs> You're a man of great energy. Uh, very interesting. And uh, it's great to see the ideas there. I guess I have a a couple questions. Um, you know, my role in the society is on the finances, so I think about money. Uh, one question is, on, can you comment at all on how geo work programs are funded? You know, what is, what is the funding mechanism for them? And, and don't spend a lot of time answering that, but I guess more importantly, REACT is a volunteer organization. You know, there's volunteers from the members. And I'm wondering, you know, a lot of these things take resources and time. And while small pilot projects might be conducted by volunteers, how can we harness or what resources are available to make a greater impact? Look, a, a very good question. To um, put it bluntly, GEO does not fund the program, the products, um, the, sorry, the, the projects. Um, but what is happening is that we're finding that um, agencies are coming in and offering to support. If you take GOFI, which was developed, um, and, and, and they did have funding support, uh, FAO took that over, right? And it's now part of FAO. So they're, they're, they're funding all the activities related to GEO and, and so in the, flag, in, in, the, in the other flagships. But um, just recently at the, at the last uh, ministerial meeting, they talked about uh, raising funds. The, and, and we now have a person in GEO headquarters tasked with going to the Bill Gates's foundations and um, World Bank and other agencies to actually bring funds to the program uh, and to be able to support activities. That, that is happening. Um, but if you came in as a, as a pilot initiative, then you'd be looking to fund your own activities. Uh, and, and this hasn't stopped people. I mean, so there's over 60, there were, there, there were something like 45 people, uh, 45 projects that were in the last program, all self-funded. 
So they, they get you get, uh, get funds from countries, you get funds from your agencies, and it, it's always been a team effort. Uh, there's many people being involved from different agencies. And so it, it's a good question, John. <laughs> um, and uh, we won't try to break the bank <laughs> in GRSS. Um, but yes, no, it, it is a fundamental question. The, the agencies in the Pacific, are, however, do have funding. They can get funding from outside sources. Um, if you if you look at the there's the French government, there's, there's very strong support from the French government, as you can imagine, in New Caledonia and um, uh, other places. The the US are very um, active in the Marshall Islands in the Northern Pacific. Um, the English, little less on funding, but certainly the Australian, New Zealand, the the if you like the English component, has a lot of funds being uh, put into the Pacific region at this particular time. So there, there, there are avenues of, of harnessing these. Great, thank you. And as I think the committee chairs are uh, aware, there are opportunities and they have been taking advantage of some small pilot projects from, from GRSS funds. But uh, I think that's definitely a, a critical part of moving this all forward but also building on ideas of citizen science where there are crowdsourcing and other mechanisms where interested people can help. So thank you very much, Tony, for the presentation. Very good, good to yeah. see you. Look, I think it's probably probably good that you should realize too that um, GRSS was one of the first groups to actually fund a, a program supporting GEO and that was in um, soil mapping in, in Africa. Um, and you might remember a few years ago, um, the Spanish, our Spanish colleagues took control of that um, and, uh, and analysed data and provided it free. Now, the funding came from um, uh, the Spanish government, but it, it, it came through, the G, through GRSS. So that, that was, a good, was a good lead. You can guess who was involved in it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, for this question and for this discussion. Are there some other questions, comments, discussion points? I do not really see, see the, the hand raised. So I was thinking more in terms of how we can connect people, the local people, uh, with the people from geoscience and remote sensing. So that's a little bit my question. And I see several opportunities. Uh, you mentioned already some of them. Training is one. Uh, I could imagine that uh, React can help in, in, let me say, organizing trainings. So, so something that we could do for local people, especially. Or what we could also do in order to connect people that are working already on specific scientific areas uh, in the Pacific region. Uh, we could also establish, let me say, an invited session in order to see uh, who's interested, right, and who's already doing something in this area. This could be something just to initiate um, people to come together and to work also together. This is something that I thought could be uh, a nice framework too. Yeah. Well, you you know then you know then those points. I've got a few here on a piece of paper which I might share with you. Um, mm -hmm. Look, I, I think I think React and global activities in, within the society could work uh, work more more closely together mm -hmm. um, on this. I think um, Geo and GRSS can work together as uh, two organisations. Um, GR, we had a we had an MOU, one of the first organisations to have an MOU with Geo, uh, and mm -hmm. and that's when the Soil Project came came about. Um, we're, we have a, an established network of linkages that we're developing. So mm -hmm. the three agencies that I mentioned are key, um, but there are other opportunities. But if, if you wanted to talk to somebody that's interested in mangrove mapping, um, we have the network and linkages. Um, I'm thinking this would be a, a, a wonderful thing for retired members of GRSS academics to be involved in. Uh, going to the Pacific Islands and, and mapping coral reefs, Mm -hmm. um, so the international agencies is something that we need to look at more seriously too, and we, we have a number of um, MOUs in the society, um, and seeking funding from non-profit organisations, I mentioned the um, 
to build gates mm -hmm. and thing, but but it's interesting. World Bank have shown an interest in a number of these activities, particularly at the at the flagship level. Um, and uh, there are other geospatial groups that we can work with. So I, I think there there are avenues out there. It, it's just if we can identify people within our own organisation that would want to champion something. Yeah, that's uh, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, if, if, if that's a possibility, then um, a, a, there's presentations. The reactors invited to make presentations uh, at that conference in December, in November, December. Okay, yeah, great, thanks. Uh, meanwhile, I see there's some other comments or questions. Uh, the first one was from Antoni Vodacek. If you can speak up. Yes, hello, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Tony, you, you mentioned um, the use of drones in, in the islands, and I know we've spoken about that before. Um, you know, I, I have to imagine that some people are using drones, um, but what do you think are some of the challenges and some of the needs directly, you know, related to the use of drone remote sensing in that area? Well, very quickly, uh, USP, University of South Pacific in Fiji, have a, a, a drone lab, um, which they, they try to work themselves. And um, the person that has been running that is about to leave the university. So I don't know where that stands, but they've been mainly working in Fiji and not in some of the other islands. But um, things that have been expressed to me is, is, is the decline in mangroves um, along a coral reef area um, of, of mapping uh, land use degradation that's taken place due to salinity intrusion. Um, the, these are immediate things uh, impacting. I think there's a good opportunity there to, if a person with your skill and your knowledge of drones and what you've been doing in Africa, I think there's a, a replication that could take place there that would, would develop a, a, uh, a, a very useful platform for them to work from. They're not, the, the, the people there are very keen to be involved with that, but they just lack the wherewithal to be able to do it and they lack the contact with our people who can train them. Um, but, but certainly coral reef, um, whitening, uh, mangroves, uh, decline and retreat, um, and land cover change that's due to the environmental changes taking place. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Them. Thanks. Lots to think way. about. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Anthony. So the next question is from Werner Wiesbeck. You're Sorry, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Still muted. Werner, you're muted. Werner, you're still muted. Oh, okay. Now, Hi, Tony. now, oh, now, now we uh, hear you. Uh, uh, Tony, Tony. Tony, what you presented is uh, primarily administration of uh, the group. What I would have expected is the idea what remote sensing could contribute. For example, the uh, land uh, coverage, the size uh, of uh, the wooden areas, for example, the humidity in the countries, and, and, and all these things, I think, uh, should be uh, developed uh, by remote sensing, but also for other uh, activities. And uh, do you have the plan to develop a strategy? What will be required and what is the basic idea? Um, I mentioned the Telenoa. <laughs> And that is a, a place for oceanic voices by oceanic voices. Um, Geo is not is is quite adamant that um, we can't solve their problems, but what we can do is we can combine to understand what their problems are, what their needs are, and try and link those with agencies and groups that may be able to help them. And GRSS is obviously a fundamental one uh, for that. The 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 strategy is to um, yes to upgrade the capacity of geospatial um, training and skill development in the region so that they can do it themselves. Uh, the three agencies that I mentioned, Werner, are, are, are very key and fundamental. 
and, and have people there that if they can get some assistance, um, they can move forward and do it. I don't know what that answer is. <laughs> but the overall strategy, <laughs> um, I won't say how difficult it's been to try and develop a community there to understand who the champions are in that community that you can go to and, uh, and try and harness. It's beginning to happen. And I tell you what, it's taken uh, uh, and the fact that COVID's there and nobody's been able to go to the, to the islands of Fiji or to uh, the New Caledonia, that has been a big problem. But uh, it continues to get some traction now. So it's a, okay, thank you. you. Ask me in 12 months what the overall strategy is. <laughs> Okay, so thanks a lot. I think uh, we are already close to one hour now, which means we uh, need to stop also. But if there is some urgent last question, sure, we can still talk about it, but I do not really see there's some hand raised in the moment. So then at the end, I'd just like to thank you again, Tony, mine for, for this really com comprehensive, uh, let me say, presentation. It was very interesting to see what is there ongoing and how many institutions are also involved. I think that's important. As I was saying, it's also great to see the needs. And we hope that we, with React, uh, that we find some support, right, uh, for these spe specific needs that they have uh, to contribute on it. And I, we will look forward to see if we can contribute also to the conference. Probably that's the first step uh, to also connect uh, to these people. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks also for the audience uh, listening today. And I hope you will join us for the next uh, webinar for the local areas, local regions of REACT. Thanks a lot and see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.